question. Copyright and open sharing of heritage collections and data. Bounty or bane for creativity in the age of AI. All right, hi. I'm so glad to be after lunch when everyone's glucose levels are up. This is great, this is always a good slot. Um, and everyone's in a good mood. Um, and we'll try to keep the conversation really um, quick and really introduce a lot of ideas uh, in a very succinct way. Um, we have a fabulous panel. I'll introduce them as we go. Um, but really excited to be talking about uh, AI and copyright, which is a huge, huge, huge issue right now. Um, I'd like to sort of start by framing our conversation um, as, you know, I think when it comes to AI and copyright issues, we really have three distinct areas. So the first area is inputs. So when you have inputs to models, um, what is the copyright implications there? The second is outputs. When the outputs look a lot like um, other works, what are the copyright implications there? And then the third is really um, copyrightability. Um, uh, and, and AI authored works. So I'm gonna kind of frame the conversation that way. Um, and I'm gonna start with inputs because I think that's where a lot of the action is right now. Um, I'm gonna start by kicking it over to Dave Hansen, um, who's the executive director of the Authors Alliance. Dave, can you start by telling us a little bit about copyright and, uh, and inputs and, and how we should think about that? Yeah, happy to. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for coming back and being lively. Uh, with us after lunch. Um, so, you know, the input question is kind of interesting to me in that um, in a lot of circles and a lot of discussions it's presented as if it's this like totally new uh, phenomenon that we're seeing, um, you know, organizations um, and projects taking large amounts of copyrighted works and doing these kinds of things that we see uh, being done to them to, to then produce um, different AI models. Uh, but there's actually a pretty long history of this kind of work um, going back uh, really to the early 2000s. And um, at, at least in US copyright law, uh, there's a pretty, um, two, two things uh, really have contributed to that. Um, one is uh, a recognition within the law that it, it's very important to protect um, the sort of free space, the commons uh, of, of ideas. And so uh, regardless of all the other things that copyright may do, it will never protect facts or ideas. Um, and so that's kind of principle number one that's been really important um, just for the development of the internet um, and, uh, and online communication. The second thing has been um, that technologies that um, work to basically extract or, or um, uh, develop uh, tools to um, take facts or ideas out of creative works, uh, those um, are very, very valuable for a whole variety of different applications. And so the way that we get to that is um, through the doctrine of fair use, which I'm sure we're gonna talk about for a bit more um, today. Um, but we, we've seen precedents uh, over the years that have really uh, very strongly valued this idea that um, copyright doesn't protect facts and ideas and that um, it is okay to copy works for the purpose of um, pulling that kind of information out. And so you see that in applications all the way from plagiarism detection software. Uh, there was a pretty big lawsuit over 10 years ago now uh, establishing a precedent saying that that's legal. Um, Google Books and Hottie Trust, those two lawsuits are often raised in the generative AI the discussion for training data. Um, those are really critical uh, precedents. But this goes much broader. I mean, it's kind of the foundation of like web, uh, web search um, and web scraping is this idea that we can um, take lots of data um, and uh, do interesting things with it. And so my perspective on it is, you know, I think that those precedents are probably right. Um, and that when we look at new technology um, and we judge it, uh, it, it's most appropriate to judge it by not kind of the technical process that we use to pull apart data and extract facts or ideas from it, but to look at what the outputs are and assess what do those look like in relation to existing creative uh, inputs and is there a copyright issue there. Awesome, Dave, this is I think such an important perspective and one that I think is, is I, I think underrepresented a lot of times in, in these conversations, which is that we have these really important um, precedents around sort of uh, how data can be used that are, that are the things that enable things like Google search, um, you know, being able to actually index and use data for, um, for, machine, for learning, for machines to learn. Um, and, and that when we have AI and the kind of response to AI, the, the gut reaction of a lot of folks is something along the lines of, um, well, hey, I don't want my data to be part of that um, input. 
Um, and the issue there is, as I hear you saying, Dave, is basically, well, yeah, but at the same time, we have these really important precedents that when there's data out there that machines can, can use it. Um, so I do want to make sure that we represent sort of both sides of, of this issue. Um, so, I, you know, and, and, and sort of talk a little bit about what the, um, you know, how, how others um, are thinking about um, inputs as well, just so we can really have a, a sense of what, what, what this issue space looks like. Um, so I think the next person I'd love to kick it over to is um, Eric Salvaggio, who is an artist and a researcher um, who recently organized an exhibition of AI pieces at DEF CON. Um, how do you think about this issue of inputs to AI models as an artist? Um, as an artist, I've been able to use, I've been able to use these models, I've been able to use data sets um, back to the Gantt days, right? People put these data sets out there. Most of the time, no one wants to grab, like, look specifically from public image domain images or anything like that, right? They're scraping things off the web, and this has been sort of open to everybody because they've been saying, well, it's, it's research, right? Um, but one of the things that I think has really changed about this conversation is that we're no longer talking about research that is distinct from the original purposes from which these data sets, and by data sets, I should clarify, if my mom puts up 40 paint oil paintings of the beach on Ma in Maine to a website, she has built a data set, right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about data sets. If we are then taking that data set that my mom has built and creating a tool that is essentially going to say, now I'm going to create a thousand pictures of the beach in your style, you're creating a output system that is in competition with the original intention of that data. So we've shifted from this thing where data was like about the material that was being studied, it was about the material being researched, very solid, very important work being done, right? You wanna understand hate speech on um, Reddit or Twitter, you want that data. You wanna be able to find things and create novel insights into it, right? putting all that information into a data set and then using that data set to generate a competitive product seems like a very different use to me. And it seems like something that calls for a very different set of priorities and thinking about what we can do to protect people like my mom who is building a data set of her paintings. So I don't disagree that like, yeah, copyright, this is all fine and good under copyright, but this, and I don't like to be an AI hype guy, but um, the law is based on precedent, right? Lawyers are always telling me I can't do things because it's against the law, um, and that's okay, but what happens when you have an unprecedented technology? Is it an opportunity to rethink some of those rules and to rethink our approaches? And one of the ways we can rethink that approach is by thinking about this material about data sets. When we talk about, oh, it's data, but like, what's in that data? Like, what is that data actually? It's my mom's paintings, right? It's poetry that people have written. It is expression. And so using that data to analyze and reproduce that seems like it should shift the conversation a bit. Thanks for that perspective, Eric. Um, I, I think it's an important one. I think you've articulated really well what we're hearing a lot of people say um, with regards to AI and input. So I think that's it's a, a, a really important perspective and, and definitely the one that I think a, a lot of folks have um, almost reflexively. Um, so um, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, Avia, I would love to um, also uh, kick it over to you to talk a little bit about this issue of inputs um, and specifically around sort of how you're thinking about um, the data that goes into these um, data sets um, as a ethics and policy researcher um, at an AI uh, company. Nonprofit. <laughs> Nonprofit. <laughs> Important distinction, I think, like in, the, in this debate is that what we, what we do is, um, is primarily into things like interpretability and normalization. Um, we deal with large language models, so I'd rather keep my remarks to, um, to just text that up, because I do think that there are different problems that arise with, with images. There, we convey a lot of information through, through, through language and through text. Um, mom's painting. Mom's painting, <laughs> not different category. Mom's poetry. Yeah. Um, there are, um, a lot of issues that I would love to sort of bring to this debate from the technical side. Um, this includes stuff like, we actually don't currently have a way to verify 
um, whether a model was trained or given inputs without um, data documentation. So what I'm saying is that unless a data set is documented, we actually don't know and have no way to, to confirm uh, what went into it. Um, this means that I think data documentation is a critical piece of this conversation that is unfortunately getting shafted to the side. Um, and the push against it currently is unfortunately in the opposite direction. Um, th there are just, th the way incentives are aligning uh, for the legislators in the field currently is to not document. Maybe they have internal documentation, but by the by the they certainly aren't making it public. Um, thinking about it sort of more holistically, there's also the question of, of attribution. Um, I'm thinking of from like an artist side in, in the sense that attribution is important. I, 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 you know, I used to draw. <laughs> this is kind of where this is coming from. Not not exactly from AI research. Um, attribution is very important to people, and this is another thing that we like technologically just do not have. There is no way for me to take an output and then um, tie it back to an input and then like, oh, these are the, you know, this is what contributed to, to making this output this particular way. You know, there's no way to sort of um, thoroughly make a list of citations. There is an implementation of something like that in Copilot, as far as I know, but what they're doing actually is just taking the output and searching for it in a training data set and saying that that's where it came from. Well, decent guess, but that's actually different than the, like what we mean by traditional attribution, right? Um, so this is a really important point that I think you're making here, which is, or, or a, very, and a very interesting point, which is the issue of um, where things actually come from and whether you are tracking whether an input makes it into the output and how you track that. And I think one thing you said that was particularly interesting there was this idea that, you know, if you're a company, if you're an AI company and you're building something, your incentive is to not track that because as soon as you, and, and to not be transparent about that. Um, and frankly, I don't think you can blame the companies because as soon as you do, as soon as you say that the inputs are, you know, from X, Y, and Z, suddenly you're gonna have three lawsuits, one from X, one from Y, and one from Z, right? Um, and so, um, you know, just given the current state of, of, of law, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting um, point there about, you know, how do we, how do we create those in incentives? Um, and we'll definitely come back to that point as well. Um, Rebecca, I'd love to hear from you um, as the executive director of All Tech is Human, how do you think about this issue of inputs into AI models? Yeah, thanks, Marta. Um, so I'm Rebecca Tweed. I'm the new executive director at All Tech is Human. Uh, we are a nonprofit based right here in Manhattan, but we have a global lens and reach. Uh, we are committed to uh, tackling thorny tech and society issues in order to co-create a tech future that is aligned with the public interest. Uh, and I think as we've seen here today, generative AI and copyright is uh, definitely thorny. Um, All Tech is Human is uh, building and strengthening the responsible technology ecosystem. Um, so part of what we're doing, we understand that the future of technology is actually intertwined with the future of democracy, with the future of work, uh, with the future of the human condition itself. And it is extremely important that we get this right. Uh, and it's crucial that we all have a voice in how these technologies are developed uh, because we all have a stake in this. Um, all of these technologies do impact society broadly, but they don't impact all of us equally. Uh, and we believe that those who have, uh, who are the most at risk for potential impacts and negative impacts deserve a prominent seat at the table. Um, so that is why part of All Tech is Human's mission is uh, career development efforts around diversifying that traditional tech pipeline so that we can include more backgrounds, more disciplines, perspectives, and lived experiences. And with generative AI, we have this incredible opportunity actually to use our voice because it is such a prominent uh, and, and very public out there kind of technology. AI has been quietly impacting us for years, but because generative AI is this massive uh, popular phenomenon, uh, we actually have this opportunity to bring the conversation to a lot more stakeholders. Uh, and not only that, not just the general public, but also policymakers who are now feeling the pressure and understand that it is urgent that the time is now that we actually uh, build some appropriate guardrails 
around these powerful new technologies that do impact everybody. And I think one thing uh, we should acknowledge is that technology does not fall fully formed from the heavens. We human beings are the ones who build these tools uh, and we should have a say in this. And I think generative AI has given us that opportunity. We now have these fairly straightforward avenues to having a say in uh, what happens uh, to our technological future. We have existing laws on the books that we are trying to determine how to interpret now that we have uh, these artificial intelligence tools. So you have, for instance, the US Federal Trade Commission uh, is determining how, um, you know, how consumer protection laws, uh, how AI is impacting those. Um, and there's an opportunity for us to uh, make our voices heard. The FTC is accepting comments. Also, the US Copyright Office is now accepting comments through mid-October, so we have an opportunity as the responsible tech community, as the open source community, um, to make our voices heard. And the second way is through new guardrails, new legislation. Um, the moment is now. There is so much momentum around this issue, finally, that it feels like uh, if there are going to be laws enacted, now is the time. So you have the EU AI Act, which is in the final stages and should likely pass by the end of the year. And now finally in the United States, we have a few different options on the table. Senator Schumer has the Safe Innovation Act that uh, you know, even today he is meeting with uh, various stakeholders that include a few civil society folks um, in DC today. And then we also have now on last Friday, uh, the USAI Act, a bipartisan bill that uh, was introduced by Senators Blumenthal and Hawley um, that has a lot of uh, support from civil society and looks very comprehensive and might actually be the one that gets across the finish line. So we have these opportunities. And finally, I wanna say we have an opportunity today. Uh, you know, We are shaping the norms around the usage of these tools. It's not just uh, slow laws or even interpreting laws that will still take years to determine. We get to have a say in the norms around these um, tools and how we use them. And I think this symposium is a, uh, is a part of shaping those norms and uh, appreciate Creative Commons for giving us this space today to have this conversation. Um, th th that's great. And I'm so glad that you um, covered those topics, Rebecca. And I, the point you're making about norms is a really important one. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that as we're talking about this issue of inputs, you know, I think you've now heard um, from Avia and Eric um, really about the sort of the reaction that folks have. Again, it's, al it's almost visceral, right? The reaction of these works, you know, whether it's <laughs> your mom's beach photos or whatever it is, being used in these um, models, that there's this reaction of, ooh, that doesn't, maybe doesn't feel right, or that there's, you know, we should know what's going into it, or, um, you know, people should be compensated for that. Um, and I think a really important thing you heard from Dave as well is on the other side of that, um, under existing precedent that's very important, you, you actually should, uh, companies should actually be able to, to go ahead and, and, and do that and, and machines should be able to learn from what's out there. That's, that's why we have things like, um, like Google search. And what Rebecca's saying here re is really interesting around norms, which is this question of, well, okay, it, it, like I think that what you're saying raises the question of, well, is what we need in order to address this tension, right? We're seeing this tension on this, even just within this panel, of, you know, on the one side, wanting creators to be compensated, wanting transparency into what's going into these models. And on the other side, this really important precedent around um, a, a, a machines being able to actually uh, use what's out there um, and, and learn from it and in order to do useful things like search index, um, you know, basically learn, right? Um, and so is law the right, is copyright law, is law in general the right way of addressing that or is it norms, right? Um, and um, so I think that's a, a, a really uh, interesting double click on, on what you're saying here, Rebecca. Um, so Dave, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You know, having, having heard from, from folks on what the, you know, the, the initial feeling is here around inputs, you know, what is it, what is it at stake um, from a legal perspective if, if, that's, if that reaction is what um, informs changes in law? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, I think it's worth um, taking a second to step back and just kind of understand copyright uh, as, um, as contrasted with a, a variety of other legal regimes that I think um, are implicated here and that may be actually a little bit more of an appropriate route for um, dealing with some of the harms or potential harms that, that could come from generative AI. But you know, copyright, um, 
Copyright is a pretty blunt instrument um, and is extremely broad. Uh, so a lot of times when we're talking about that, we're talking when we talk about copyright, we're thinking about like paintings or poetry or written published works. Um, but copyright is this instantaneous thing that attaches to every creative work. I, I could almost guarantee you, like each one of you has created some sort of copyrighted work while you've been sitting in this room uh, since you got here this morning. And um, with that work, uh, if you had the full weight of the law, and you, we didn't have access to, um, you know, defenses like fair use, for example, right? Uh, somebody quotes from you, and under existing law, you know, that's potentially. A, uh, a lawsuit that's worth $150,000 per work infringed. And so that's like pretty extreme. Um, and I think sometimes it's important to, um, to understand the full scope of what that means when we're saying things like it should be copyright infringement if you're not attributed um, appropriately uh, uh, or, or other things like that. You know, that, that um, takes things to a level that uh, can have real chilling effects on um, research that's been using this kind of technology for a long time, um, on interesting new applications where people are using it in their creative process. Uh, at our workshop yesterday, we heard a lot about different people using this in their work um, currently, and so uh, it, it could have some real potential knock-on effects there. But I think beyond um, a lot of what we are seeing right now with generative AI, uh, those sort of, a, a change in the law that would sort of eliminate or minimize the ability of organizations or people to um, essentially extract facts and information from creative works and then uh, use that to detect patterns, to identify themes, um, and, uh, and, and um, create these generative AI tools and other tools. It would have a dramatic impact, I think, across a lot of other areas where um, it would take a while to see. Uh, you know, I work a lot of, with um, researchers who are doing text and data mining work. Um, really fascinating, you know, able to take uh, medical imaging, for example, uh, which, by the way, we don't think of as a copyrighted work, but actually is in a lot of cases, um, and use it to detect diseases uh, and to um, identify uh, uh, symptoms and then um, come up with uh, potential plans of action. And you see it in all sorts of research, from that to uh, um, there's an interesting project out at uh, Stanford where they were taking police body cam footage and then trying to understand like how did the police actually interact with the people who they're talking with and doing a sort of sociological um, study. And those are the kinds of things that I think, um, you know, if fair use doesn't apply here, it's hard to see how it, it wouldn't uh, also impact those kinds of applications. Um, I think those research uses are uh, incredibly um, important to protect. So this is um, this is a great a great point, Dave. Um, which is you know sort of the idea of copyright law as you know of, of these copyright law precedents as being very important um, in general, and you know while at the same time acknowledging the you know the response that um, folks have to AI, um, important to keep in mind that maybe the right thing the right way to address it isn't necessarily an overhaul of copyright law. That what, maybe what we need to do is continue to make sure that we um, protect uh, fair use um, and, and, and related doctrines. Um, it, so I guess on that topic um, for others, I'd like to open up to the rest of the panel on, you know, what, what are the right instruments for addressing that? Is it norms? Um, is it, um, you know, for, for example, there's, um, uh, with web scraping, um, there is, you know, an ability that is not in, not in the law, but really is just a norm um, for, for websites to say, you know, actually don't scan this website, um, and uh, robots.txt, right? And um, is it, so is it norms? Is it norms, is norms the right tool for addressing these concerns? Is it technology? Um, Avia, you were talking a little bit about, about tech, um, or, or do other panelists think it is changes uh, in, in law? And if so, is it copyright law? Is it a different law? What, what is it? So I wanna open it up to, to how do we address those concerns while at the same time preserving these precedents? Well, and, and Avia also, because Avia also had, you know, some really interesting tech, um, I think, tech insights here. I, I, I mean, I, I would just say quickly, I think one of the opportunities that this gives us an opportunity, uh, one of the opportunities for an opportunity, um, one of the things we could be doing with this conversation too, not this particular conversation, but generative AI, is about thinking about what data rights mean to us and whether or not we actually think that putting something online means that we lose control over it. Um, 
fundamentally that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like that is all going to encourage the type of free sharing uh, that Creative Commons was created, right, to, to advocate for. If my fear is that if I share this drawing, it's going to be used against me by a model, by a company for profit. And so there needs to be some kind of mechanism. And I think part of those mechanisms comes from who are we sharing these images with, right? Usually it's social media companies, it's platforms that are taking that and they're saying, oh, we have the right to sell this. And I think that is one lever where we can think, do they, should they? Is that something that we can't resist somehow or have greater uh, agency over as individual creators? Um, so this question of data rights and what uh, organizations, uh, online archives, social media websites can do with the information we share, if we really want people to share things that are thoughtful, if we really want to look at someone's illustration that they've actually put effort and time into, which could be AI generated, by the way, um, although that's a totally different conversation. But do we want to say that they have to give up their control over how that's used because they've shared it on Twitter? I don't think we should. I don't think that supports a healthy ecosystem. I don't think that sh is encouraging people to share. And if we actually want to encourage that, then we need to rethink exactly how we are going to do that and what these relationships with these companies are. In the US, I think data rights is a really undervalued conversation. We don't have a lot of it. Uh, and I'd love to see this maybe, you know, may, maybe it starts a flourishing of data rights positions and policies and debates. That would be incredible. Eric, that's um, a, a great point. And I, I think, you know, for uh, one of the things you said that was, you know, particularly interesting is, you know, thinking about the commons, right, and how we protect the commons. And, you know, Creative Commons created CC licenses specifically uh, to enable creators to clearly communicate to others um, how others can use their works, which really enables people to share things more, right, not to, in order to take things out of the commons. So how do we, when it comes to, um, you know, talking about how our works can be used by AI, how do we both, um, clearly communicate and um, uh, e enable creators to clearly communicate in order to share more rather than taking things out of the commons? How do we protect the commons and, and protect these important fair use rights um, while we um, address these concerns? Um, so would also love to hear, you know, a, a, from Avia and Rebecca, you know, is it norms, is it tech? How, like, what are your thoughts um, and ideas on how we address those concerns while protecting important precedents and protecting the commons? Um, I think an important part of this is also understanding the, the use cases. Um, certain people are just against their data being used, but other people have, have different concerns. They, they don't want it to be misused, or they would like to be compensated, or they would like to be, be attributed, you know, they would like to be acknowledged as um, like contributors to a given to a given system, so um, um, I, I bring this up to um, sort of point out that this is this is a complicated debate, and I, I do agree with with Dave insofar as I don't think that like copyright is the one solution to all the societal problems that we're talking about. Um, speaking of which, an, another approach that um, we actually support is. Um, that taken by the Writers Guild of America, who identified that th their their problem is a basically a labor issue, right? It's a it's a it's a labor issue in the sense that um, people are concerned about being able to make a living, um, and from that perspective, we think that um, you know, actually the WGA approach um, makes a lot of sense and like correctly identifies um, sort of leverage and 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 where the pressure is being applied. You know, it, it almost doesn't matter what the an executive decides that it's now doing your job, it's, it's immaterial what, the <laughs> what, what, what the tech is doing in that situation. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. I think one thing we have to acknowledge is that we are, you know, we're not talking just about copyright. We're not talking just about like one person's one piece of art. Uh, we aren't even talking about one person's like collected body of 40 paintings. We are. Uh, you know, it is linked to this issue of, uh, you know, 
an entire creative professionals in general, the, the future of their ability to make a living at this if, if everyone's uh, copywritten works are collectively uh, you know, scraped and utilized by for-profit companies um, to, to then do your job for you. Uh, you know, because those are intertwined as issues, um, you know, copyright is not explicitly uh, the, the, the only space where we need to be talking about things. I think this is an opportunity, uh, you know, novel problems call for novel solutions. I think this is an opportunity um, to, to rethink, to Eric's point, to be rethinking how, how do we want our data to be used? How do we uh, want these technologies um, to be used more broadly? And I, I do wanna say, I, I think the, the Creative Commons um, exploration around preference signaling, I think is a great uh, kind of adaptation um, to be able to kind of have the opportunity as creators to say, if and under what circumstances you, uh, I would like my own um, data and creations to be utilized. Um, so I think it needs to be a multi-pronged approach um, going forward. Dave, anything to add here? Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, in terms of particular regulation outside of copyright, where I see a lot of the harms um, are on the output side, uh, and particularly where generative AI is used for fraud or disinformation, um, I think that those, there's probably some room there for regulation. Uh, probably also um, around um, exploitation of people's uh, uh, personalities or personas, um, rights of publicity. Uh, but really what I wanted to say actually was going back a little bit to the discussion about the commons. Um, I think it's important to appreciate that like, it, it, taking generative AI out of the discussion, um, we live in a society where we have all benefited from um, uncompensated and unconsented to uh, exploitation of other people's works. Um, that's how we learn, right? Like every time we read a book, we don't ask like, am I allowed to process and absorb this information and use it in my own life, <laughs> right? Um, and the fact that we are using technology to help facilitate that kind of process, uh, it does change the conversation. I, I don't think that it's exactly the same, but I do think it's important to recognize that like this is the world that has produced an incredible amount of innovation because we do have this free exchange of idea. And I think it's extremely important to protect that. Great, and so you know, I mentioned um, at the beginning, and Dave, you uh, I think have uh, given us a good segue into outputs, but I mentioned that this is really, um, when you think about copyright and AI, you, you really can divide it into three buckets, which is um, inputs, which we've been discussing so far, um, and then outputs, um, so what, what is the model outputting? Um, and then um, authorship and, and copyrightability. Um, so I think, I think uh, fairly we have spent most of the time on inputs because that is in fact where all the action is at the moment um, and where there are a lot of really interesting questions. But in our remaining 10 minutes, I, I do wanna at least touch on these other two distinct areas of copyright um, issues involving AI. Um, and I think outputs, um, you know, Dave, you started us um, thinking about outputs um, and, and you know, what happens when the outputs are uh, too similar to the um, inputs, and also what happens when the outputs are, you know, as you were just saying, um, used, you know, used for evil instead of good. Um, so maybe if you want to just start by giving us a little bit on your thoughts on outputs, and then I'll kick it over to others to talk about um, outputs as well, and then we'll try to at least at least uh, hint at the topic of uh, copyrightability. Sure, um, so copyright 101, um, if you photocopy somebody's stuff uh, and your output is like almost identical, copyright infringement, unless you have some sort of extra permission or, or uh, uh, defense like fair use. Um, and that, the standard that the courts have used for that is substantial similarity, so it doesn't have to be a perfect photocopy, there can be all sorts of other elements that you've taken uh, that feed into that output that can indicate that you've infringed uh, the, the owner's rights. And that standard actually seems to me like a pretty good place to start for assessing um, whether there's copyright infringement in generative AI outputs. Um, and you can see this um, looking at certain models, right? Uh, th there's a, a law professor at Emory, um, Matt Sag, who writes a lot about this and the problem of uh, essentially memorization and protecting, um, protecting uh, uh, from producing like clearly infringing outputs. He calls it the Snoopy problem. If you, if you ask for a drawing of Snoopy, you're gonna get Snoopy. Um, and <laughs> so, like, 
it, that, that's a copyright problem. And there are ways to protect against that, I think, at the system level. Um, but just looking at the individual output and whether it's infringing, that seems to me like probably the right place to start from a copyright perspective. And for others on the panel, I'd love to hear your views on this. Um, Avia, especially you, because I think you know the, the tech that you're, you've been talking about is also really interesting here. Um, so maybe starting with you on your thoughts on outputs and, and um, then over to others on the panel. Yeah. Um, the good news is that female recognition is an active area of study, one that's being studied actually. And again, this is still like emerging literature, but there are certain things that, that you can do in order to minimize the risk of memorization. And the highest percentage and anyone has ever found in, in a study is like under 5%. And in a real world setting, it's like way less than one-tenth of one percent. So unfortunately, it's not, um, it's not happening that often, um, thankfully. Um, I do agree that, um, and, and this is what Matthew Tag argues too, that when you have a customer-facing uh, product, there are additional guardrails that, that can be put so that um, you, know, you translate like Mickey Mouse to some other prompt that doesn't, doesn't immediately invoke the image of Mickey Mouse, for example. Um, so yeah. We're working on it. The problem is that you know everyone is working on it as we're trying to find a solution to these issues. So it's like, it's really like we're all on this um, very rapid journey. Yeah, and any other thoughts from other panelists on outputs before we talk about copyrightability? My thoughts apply to copyrightability, so I'll wait for that question. Okay, great. So, and so we're just also gonna, I also wanna cover the topic um, briefly, uh, the, this third topic within AI and copyright, uh, AI and copyright which is copyrightability. When you have an AI generated work, um, what is the, um, it, who, who's co who, can you go and register that copyright? If so, whose copyright is it? Is it the person who wrote the code? Is it the machine? Um, is it the person who put in the prompt? Um, really interesting and there's a lot of um, action there. Um, Dave, do you want to give us just a quick um, sort of like where are we on that and, and wh like what are the thoughts on that? And then um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Eric uh, and Rebecca and Avia for their thoughts on copyrightability. Sure. Um, so the current state of the law is to obtain a copyright, you have to have a human author. You have to have uh, human authorship. And um, we have one case on this so far. Uh, the Copyright Office has um, established that standard for registering a copyright. And there was a suit that went up in the D.C. District Court, uh, Thaler versus um, Perlmutter. And the court affirmed that idea that like, if you are going in and you have a AI generated work and there is really no human creativity added to the output, um, that's not going to be protectable. The office um, has so some guidance that isn't necessarily binding on anybody except for the process of registration um, to kind of suss out like, well, what happens when you have output that's like partly AI generated, but also has human input added to it? And like, how do you have to handle that? The office's approach has been to basically say you have to disclose the parts that are AI generated and those don't receive protection. Um, but that's pretty challenging for a lot of people where human creation and AI creation are very melded together. But that's sort of the state of the law right now. Eric, what are your thoughts on this? Um, to me, this, this hits on one of the things that is a real paradox with AI is that we tend to give it too much credit um, AI is not like a, a guy in a box, right? And this guy in a box isn't the one making the work. Um, AI is a system. AI is a, a set of entanglements, I like to say, between the people making the training data, the people building the models, the people building the um, regular, the content moderation systems that block certain outputs on those models. And it is also the people who are taking those images and recirculating them, right? Every single piece of that is driven by a human being. This is a, a system that is built by humans, trained by, on human training data. It is steered by humans who are typing prompts into the window, who are then taking these images and recirculating them according to their own contexts and demands and desires. And I think to say the AI made the picture cuts out a crucial systemic understanding of what AI is and all of the things that come along with it. It also is like dangerously close to saying that the AI is creative. And you can get into a lot of conversations about what it means to be creative. Uh, that's fine. We can call it creative by some definitions and not by others. But by copyright law, it seems unhelpful to define it as creative, as the creative agent in this process. 
I don't know. I am not a lawyer. Um, I'm sure the lawyer is laughing at a lot of my ideas, and that's fine. But it seems to me like um, one of the things that we really should be thinking about is sort of systemic authorship, because this is what we have. We have a systemic authorship situation. And it might be more comparable to looking like something like the film industry, where you have the best boy and the gaffer and the writer and the director, right? This is a similar set of relationships that might apply to protecting the outputs of these works. But by saying the AI did this, and the AI can't give us permission to copyright it, so therefore it can't be copyrighted, that isn't helpful. It's just not helpful. Whether or not it's right or wrong, it's not useful. And so I think that's one of those things that we might Again, it's an opportunity to think about systemic creativity as opposed to this focus on individuals and individual artists that we have and individual technologies that we have. Why not use this opportunity to say, actually, we are like connected in the creative fabric. We always keep hearing this thing. Everything is a remix, right? That doesn't mean throw out authorship. It doesn't mean throw out citation. It doesn't mean ignore the labor. It means let's look at that collaborative process that went into these outputs and think about how to treat that as a collective authorship problem. Um, Eric, that's a, a, a really great, you, you make really great points. And you know, I'm of course reminded of the fact that when uh, the camera came out, at that point there was a case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court about whether, um, whether, you ca whether the person who took the photo has the ability to, to uh, copyright their, uh, their work given that it went through this machine. Um, so I think the moderator's most important job is to uh, end on time. Um, but you've heard uh, through this uh, <laughs> uh, meandering through uh, copyright and AI about um, input, output, and authorship. Um, you've heard in inputs about this sort of reaction to really wanting um, you know, potential compensation for creators and also transparency about um, what is being used and, and how. Um, but at the same time, you've heard about the importance of protecting precedent that really enables um, our commons and, and free sharing and, and speech. Um, and fair use. Um, and then you've heard about the questions around um, uh, what are the right tools for addressing those concerns and, and uh, you know, is it copyright? Is it other laws that aren't copyright? Um, is it norms? Um, all important questions um, and this is really just uh, the beginning of the conversation, not the end, uh, so please thank me. Join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>